It never ends, does it? <laughs> yeah. They do have to be on They do. All right, we've got reading now. I've already asked one, but up in Rio Grande Economic Development, and we're, we're doing housing because people can't live here, they can't shop here, they can't work here, and there is no economic development. Hey, you didn't? We need that. Yeah, yeah. And then Bonnie asked one with up in Rio Grande Economic Development. Uh, I'm a Christopher Dahl, school teacher. I live here in Del Norte. I teach in El Norte. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, my interest in housing goes way back. I trained as an attorney. I studied land use planning, land use law. Um, and I uh, am concerned that the housing stock in the area is uh, depleted, uh, damaged substandard, uh, not well maintained, um, and it's not affordable. There's a difficult to find reasonable housing, and now living on a school teacher's budget, what I see, and more importantly, being surrounded by younger school teachers just coming out of school, they can't afford to live in the community where they teach, um, and they can't afford to maintain the houses they live in, and I don't think that's unique to the teaching profession. I think that to anybody Anybody who's young and trying to start out and trying to start a family and establish a place in the community, uh, it's very difficult for them to get their foot on the bottom rung of the economic ladder if they can't get into reasonable affordable housing that they can afford to not only own but also maintain uh, and try to raise a family. Thank you for sharing. I'm Mike Hurst. I'm uh, running Delmore Bank. Um, obviously, housing is a big part of what we're concerned about for. How it's inhibiting economic growth. I think and, uh, there's all the tools are here to see some really fantastic growth, but we don't have any place to put people. So, does your bank do residential lending as well? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, my name is Laura Anselm. I'm a trustee in the in the town here. Awesome. And so, yeah, I feel like as a representative of the community, um, yeah, it's in the best interest to make sure that the community can live in back here. Thank you. I'm Mark Lanson. I am here for two reasons. One, uh, I moved here about seven years ago from Jackson, Wyoming, where affordable housing is, uh, doesn't really exist. <laughs> um, and so the issue is uh, from having uh, lived there and seeing what, um, how, how much further that stratifies the community to have that sort of housing issue. It is uh, near and dear to my heart as an issue that I would like to not see get worse here in particular. Uh, and then also, I work for the U.S. Forest Service, and I'm employed in Denali, which is coming to the same sort of issues that you're bringing up, that if we want to have people here, if we want to have employees, then we need to be able to help them. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. So I'm Donna Milgaris. I'm the one you guys have been emailing about the housing study. I work for the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition. And um, I'm here to see how we can take all this money Andrew has. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do, guys, is take out Andrew's money. <laughs> um, we run down payment assistance programs. We have two of them going currently and a home rehab program through, funded through the Division of Housing. Uh, we also have a household well water program for those living outside of city limits who need to replace or repair a well. Um, we're getting ready to open up a tool barn to help people have the tools they need to do repair, smaller repairs on their home, like in the next two or three weeks. And we're reaching out for lots of new programs and, and new ways to bring housing or repair the housing that's already here and bring it back to use. Thanks, Don. Let's go to the people on the phone. Yeah, so um, I see Jeff, would you like to start? Sure, uh, Jeff Owsley, I'm with CHAPA, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, and I'm the Community Relationship Manager for nine counties of Colorado, uh, based in Alamosa. And so I cover all the San Luis Valley and uh, just very excited about this housing needs assessment that we have been uh, happening. Something to really look forward to is the action plan process that is a complete different process or another uh, 
process after this uh, for the housing needs assessment to come up with distinct action plans that we can do. Uh, so I'm really interested to see how this conversation progresses today that will help to inform that action plan. Um, so uh, just excited to have you all here. Thanks. How about Rick? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'm uh, on the South Fork, uh, South Fork Board of Trustees and um, also on a group that is recently formed to look into providing affordable housing in South Fork. So I just found out about this meeting uh, and decided to join and see what's going on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Joe? Uh, hi there, I'm, I'm Joe Ford and along with Rick Morgan, I am from South Fork where uh, we're, we're facing many of the same issues as, as the rest of you guys. So we're definitely interested interested in listening and learning and, and putting it into action. Glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Randy? Oh, Randy, we can't hear you. Sorry, is that better? That is. Hi, Randy Sneed, assistant with Department of Local Affairs, and we're helping to support the community level assessment so I'm just here to listen thank you thank you and then it just says hi <laughs> <laughs> they may not have a speaker okay how about Andrew yeah good morning everybody Andrew Coburn with urban rural continuum I am part of the consulting team that prepared the housing needs assessment. Um, I'm working closely with Willa and WSW Consulting on the reports. And thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. And then just a quick note, um, if we could thank Jeff and Randy because both of their companies helped fund a big chunk of our study along with the Colorado Health Foundation. So without their support, we would not have been able to reach um, valley-wide or at least not into each individual community. So their financial contributions to this have been very helpful. Thanks to Don for uh, ring-leaning this whole thing. <laughs> so thanks, Don. And we have one um, newcomer in the room. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and just um, share a little bit about your interest in housing? Welcome. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you want? Oh, welcome. I just said welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and share, oh. share a little interest in housing? My my name is Richard Ben Wagenen. Uh, I live at the senior apartments here. I've lived in the valley since 2015. I came from the Denver area. Uh, Lived there all my life. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Sure. All right, let's jump into our little presentation. Um, so we have, if you can, um, Don will move the slides along. So we kind of have three parts to our discussion. Um, I want to share a few highlights from this document. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about South Fork and Del Norte specifically. Um, and then we'll go into a discussion of sort of um, your all vision and, and the opportunities. And so that's the majority of our meeting. And we just have the same one. Um, so we already did our introductions. We were, um, we, we will plan to spend about 15, 20 minutes on the slideshow. Um, and then we'll be into our uh, discussion. And I think um, we will stay together. We had initially thought we might break into small groups, but I think we found yesterday up in Sawatch, it's really helpful for everyone to hear from each other um, in that discussion. So um, we'll all stay in the room together. Um, and we'll have you out of here by 11.30 or so. Um, so this study covers the whole six county area. Um, we can keep going. And um, this is available on Don's website if you don't have it already. Um, and this is the deep dive with all the graphs and stats and research and how it was done um, that backs up 
everyone's observations that you already shared that there are housing challenges. Um, and so it, it just does the quantified work there for you and that can help funders and um, members of the community who may need sort of the science of it. Um, and it also helps target specifically, okay, we know we have a gap, but um, where is that, you know, relative to income phase in your life types of housing. So why is there a housing problem? What's the sort of like underlying thing? It's, it's a vexing problem and it doesn't have simple solutions. Um, and so we put together this sort of puzzle pieces um, work, which is in, in front of you as well, if you can see it better there. But you know, we all observe increasing prices anecdotally and factually. <laughs> um, rents and for sale have been going up quite a bit and COVID has kind of added some fuel to that fire. Um, and then the market isn't kind of coming up to meet that demand because construction materials and labor shortages and the cost of construction keeps going up too. So it's very hard to make housing new housing profitable. Um, and so it's sort of like there's this disconnect. Okay, we know we have not enough supply, but the, the um, we have a lot of demand, not enough supply. The supply side kind of can't come up to meet it because of the construction costs. So then people have high housing payments, right? Like they're stressed by their housing and they're paying a lot more than the sort of traditional 30% of their income. Um, and this is particularly a, a affecting renters across the valley. And it goes to the comment about new school teachers moving in um, or you know, employees with the bank, et cetera. Um, and so that, you know, that has a lot of trickle through effects in people's health and well-being overall. If, you, if you're stressed out by your housing payment and you're not being able to pay for the other things you need in your life just to just to survive. Um, the other dynamic we saw quite a bit of is forced commuting. So you can't find a house in the place where you work. So then you have to go find a house somewhere else. And, um, and there's kind of a hopscotch effect because then that community doesn't have housing for the people who work there. And um, people have a lot of hidden costs around commuting. You may already own a car, but the cost of the time and the mileage and the wear and tear on your car is really significant. Um, and so we were seeing for some households in the Valley, it's over $1,000 a month. I mean, that's, a, that's in itself a not affordable housing payment. Um, so that increases the ways in which housing, the housing market is kind of, um, has some problems. Another dynamic, and this is pretty striking, you probably can barely see it, but it's 73% of new homes throughout the Valley are being built in the unincorporated areas. So, um, you know, the most efficient, kind of with infrastructure and the services like EMT and fire and everything, the most efficient use is close into our towns that already exist. But the dynamics that we have going on are that we're building in the unincorporated areas and we're kind of creating a rural sprawl, we'll call it. Um, very limited housing choices. So um, often people are being forced to make it, a, they're, they're compromising a lot on their housing. They're not getting, uh, the quality or the size or the location, et cetera, that they want. Well, come, come on up. Can you hear me better? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, here, can I get to your chair? You are welcome to sit as close as you are. Okay. Um, all right. So then um, another thing that we saw was an erosion of your, your prime working age households. People um, either, you know, moving away from the valley or not coming, not relocating to the valley. And so you have to have a barbell of population very young and older. And then um, overall labor shortage. This was a consistent theme when we, because we interviewed and surveyed employers. Um, and so that loops kind of right back into the increasing prices. People can't, you can't attract or retain the employees you need. Um, so this is all this is all to the vicious cycle kind of problem, um, and we'll get into the solutions in our conversation. So um, employers were very um, consistently um, well. There's a lot of consensus that this is a problem. So more than half of employers felt it was the most serious or one of the most serious problems in the valley, and um, you know. And then when you look at, if you include employers that think it's a moderate problem, it's almost the whole pie. <clears throat> we did capture about 27% of the jobs in the Valley by talking to employers and surveying them. So there's plenty more employers out there, but we think this is pretty representative. We got good sampling across industries. All right, so the bottom line, 
um, out of our assessment is that um, 1,805 units, both single family, multifamily, any kind of housing unit are needed over the next to kind of catch up with your existing, like get your market functional and keep up with the jobs that are protected over the next five years. So this is a huge number. Um, and when we look at kind of the historic rates of the production, we are not close to this. And this is not a number we should all take on and say, well, we're gonna do that much, but it just gives us a sense of, this is why we feel like we're kind of in a deep housing hole. Um, it's, we, there's a lot of catching up to do and there's um, a lot needed to keep up because um, jobs have been growing so much faster than housing. So um, we took a couple different approaches at looking at how you might, uh, and this is just a mathematical exercise because really like policymakers will decide where, and the market will decide where things end up. Um, and you can make strategic decisions about that. But we said, if you take this number, the 1,885 and spread it across the whole valley based on either where jobs are already located or where households are already located, it could look like this. And you're, you, know, you won't be surprised to see that Alamosa is the major hub. And then you know, the other counties all have their sort of proportionate share. Um, so kind of an, a fair balance between households and jobs. It may not be that it's, you still may have a lot of that forced commuting dynamic going on, but you kind of have potential there. You know, either way you look at it, you're looking at um, you know, somewhere uh, in the high 400 unit range. Um, so, and like I said, you know, I think policymakers should, should make goals that are a lesser amount um, than this and sort of start small and test your market, but that is the big picture. Um, okay, so there's five key recommendations coming out of this needs assessment document. And um, you all summed up the first one really well in the introduction. Economic development and housing go hand in hand. You can't, if your jobs get way out in front of the housing, you know, it all, it starts to break down and vice versa. Um, you know, if, if we've got plenty of housing and no jobs, that doesn't create a good, um, you know, a sustainable situation either. So um, keeping those, and I'm really excited to see economic development um, agencies so much focused on housing these days because um, I think that's really strengthening the efforts for everybody. Um, and then, you know, more housing is needed across a spectrum of housing types and price points. There's no single like laser focused thing we should do. Um, there are, we need to do very affordable rentals. We need to do moderately affordable rentals. We need to do very affordable home ownership. We need to take care of the inventory we already have. Um, we also have a lot of a missing middle dynamic. People with assets from other places are able to participate in our housing market, our for sale housing market. People who are making their wages and don't have assets from other places um, here in the Valley need some help. And then, um, you know, we're, we're certainly a regional economy, but there's really uniqueness to each market. And so I think that that's part of this community specific work um, is to, to kind of hone in on those dynamics and, and not try to make, there are some strategies that we may, that Dawn, for example, who's a regional, you know, heads a regional agency, she may be able to support everyone across the valley with, but there's a lot of things that are more like, we should only do this in Del Norte <laughs> or um, wow, that really won't be a fit in Creek. Um, and then some, you know, start small and build on promising practices. I think that when we see a number as big as the one I showed you, we kind of want to swing for the fences. And um, yet this is a fragile, you, you know, the small communities have sort of fragile markets and a big, and a big failure um, or a big risk where, where the both public sector and the private sector lose a lot of money, um, you know, is not where we want to go. We want to kind of build a track record and momentum and this is a long, commit to a long-term effort to solve this. Um, and then diversity, equity, and inclusion going forward. Um, we wanna make sure, or we recommend that our housing policies um, not create winners and losers. Like we wanna float the whole boat and have everyone um, come out of uh, our work better than they would have been. So this is a tool, the housing rainbow is in your, I see some people are already turned to it. Um, it's in your packet and it just, starts to correlate the, um, 
the types of housing and the incomes that we're talking about when I say we need a whole spectrum of housing. Um, you know, we could say people in the green at the high end of your market, they have a lot of choices these days. When I was looking at the MLS listings, that, um, you know, over 200% AMI, you could buy a house. Um, but really, the majority of the people in our communities here in Rio Grande County are, you know, much more in the um, sort of orange, yellow, orange, and red uh, categories. Um, so, oh, and then another thing to highlight on this slide is that a lot of the work um, that Andrew funds, for example, um, serves under 80%, uh, and the AMI stands for Area Median Income. So that's just a, um, a standardized metric of income that is measured annually. I'm sorry, where is this, Andrew, you started a sentence. Where, did, where does his focus? Oh, he focuses on funding uh, people below 80% area income. Um, so there's there's certain funding resources that kind of align with these um, with this chart. Um, so let's pause here then and talk about are there questions about what we've covered so far? Um, anything anyone would like to delve into? I'm curious about the study that generated this number of housing units that are likely to be needed. What's the back look, the, the look back yeah. to create that trajectory? And I'm wondering, you know, we have real time and we have a very significant change to some water rules that I think are, could range from you know, very concerning to devastating. Uh -huh. And this could change the whole picture. Absolutely. So I'm wondering, was there, you know, what's that tough look back period and what factors were considered in the forecast? Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, I want to hear more about those rule changes. Um, <laughs> so do we. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so if you happen to have a report, I know yeah, um, I it's page 12. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is where we enumerate the catch up portion of that need. So we looked at, so, and we really looked at today's, the catch up is based on a snapshot of, you know, when we were, when we were generating this report in March, but it was unfilled jobs, 4% of jobs led to a need for about 80 units, a functional rental market. So our Rental market is approaching zero. You know, I mean, you all know no one can find anything. Um, so if we consider 5% vacancy a functional rental market, so that created a need for about 211 units. And then we were looking for a balanced for sale market, which would be about six months of inventory. Um, and so that's a, a need of about 120. And then we did an adjustment for pending development because there's like, for example, you know, a, a good size uh, rental housing project going in Alamosa. Um, so, okay, that's not the market yet, but we know it will. Um, and then as we looked out, we did job growth based on a growth rate of um, about 1% per year. And then we looked at employee, retiring employees, which is a huge dynamic in your market um, across the valley. It's like people are planning to retire in the next five years and they are planning to stay in their home. So when they leave, a new employee needs to move to the valley and they will not have a place to live. Um, so that is, you know, that's a very significant portion of the need, about 880. Oh, thanks, Don. <laughs> You're so on it. Um, all right. Does that answer, does that kind of get at your question? Um, so we did not, so this, um, this assessment shows what's needed. It does not, it does not talk about the constraints that are in place, impeding your ability to get there like water, uh, that's a, which is a huge one um, in general. And I, I, I'll we'll learn more about the specifics. Um, all right, so any other questions um, on sort of the big picture um, report? And I, I guess, well, just a comment, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, this rainbow. Yes. I'm not sure that that, uh, that 150 AMI would feel green. Um, I think that <laughs> the limitations in that market are, are pretty 
highly constrained to. Okay. It's only in that last area, at least in the west end of the valley in Creed, that I think uh, I think we're we're in trouble all the way through the spectrum. Um, I think that is a very fair comment, and I think we can adjust the colors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we actually so, like the COVID. Yeah, it's like the Corona, <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> Yeah, um, so we started using the rainbow two decades ago, um, and and it, yeah, the colors could be, I don't know, yeah, colors could do some work. Um, all right. I have another question too yeah. on, the, on the keep up and the catching up and keeping up. Can you take your mask off when you talk so they can hear you no, for sure. online? I have to say, like, I'm kind of confused on the mask expectations because the email was clear that you wanted people, everyone must wear a mask if you're in person, and so I'm looking to defer to yeah what so, so we were to able to spread out a lot more than we anticipated so you're Excellent. welcome to take it off okay, <laughs> yeah. I, and i was just trying to not be muffled as a presenter and i'll put it on, on when i'm done okay, thanks for the clarification mm -hmm. yeah. so uh mike on the on the keeping up and i don't know that it's possible to do this but i'm just wondering about also needing to keep up with whether it's um real estate uh, speculation from outside or just i mean i know that it's uh, flag in here, but just the people coming from outside who, for whether it's speculation or not, but who are attracted to our not green to us prices, uh, <laughs> but green to other people from elsewhere, and how that gets captured in the keeping up with what is demand. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a really good point because you may be like, if we were to then do, if we were to update your assessment in five years, we might find that if you're, a lot of your inventory is switching from a year-round renter to a short-term rental, for example, you're actually losing some ground. Um, yeah, so that is something that we um, keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely a concern. And you and we and I think that um, particularly in South Fork, the amount of homes that are already owned by second homeowners, you know, and just how the existing inventory is being used is a big deal. Um, and so we kind of, you know, we capture, like, if you're able to, and we've seen some other communities do this, take a lot of actions to get unoccupied housing inventory back into the year round supply, you can solve your housing problems that way without having to build very expensive new housing. Um, and so that, you know, sometimes that looks like limits on short term rentals, or it looks like um incentives to get landlords to do that or some of the things don and i were talking about yesterday up in Zawatch were around what are the homes that aren't being used that could be used like could we get could we do renovation on an abandoned home uh, to get back in the inventory so yeah uh, this is yes please Go. on the phone this is rick morgan and i was uh, going to just second that um in south fork that is a major problem the short-term rental issue um, and not just for the people that currently own homes, but even getting developers to come in and build something, they, they can do better doing, you know, building something that is aimed at that short-term rental market. So I think that's something we're really um, faced with. Definitely. Okay. Um, well, let's keep going. Um, and um, so we want to now kind of turn our attention to the specific communities. Um, so we'll look at Delmore first. She's getting there. <laughs> there's um, boxes that pop up. So this is, we wanted to create sort of a simple dashboard so you can look at some key metrics in your community um, just right out of the gate. And then um, what we want to add to this, I think, ha having listened already some, is what percent of the homes are occupied year round. Um, and uh, maybe a few other things. So I'll be curious to hear from you. Um, but I think you know it was it it was important to see very few homes for sale or for rent. As you know, sort of tight as we described, what is on the market is not aligning with local wages. Um, yeah, this quote from the employer survey was really helpful. It's like um, rents for homes are oddly high compared to wages. And that's that scarcity driving those rents up. And it gives landlords kind of the opportunity to just take the pick of the litter rather than, um, than housing being available for everyone. Um, let's keep going. 
So we then, and I'm sorry, because this is hard to so hopefully you can look at what's in front of you. Um, this is a more detailed approach at um, the, it's taking those, those area needed incomes that are in the rainbow, showing what the actual household income is, because often that's like how we can quantify this stuff in our own minds. And then what can that afford? Um, just based on sort of typical mortgage assumptions and rents. And you know, what we see um, in Rio Grande County is that um, most people need a rental under about $710 a month. That will vary depending on your household size a little bit. Um, and that most people need a home to purchase that is under 200,000. We can sort of stretch and get into that 300,000 range and still be serving some locals. But at anything above that is, you know, is going to be pretty out of reach for most people here. Um, and so then we apply those, you know, sort of numbers and ranges and say, well, if, if you know, um, Del Norte is 14% of Rio Grande's overall households, that translates into this many housing units. So um, this is sort of the fun the fun math part of it we get to do, you all here can say, wow, you know, given that there's all this rural sprawl, we want to actually have more happen here within the city limits. Or um, gosh, you know, uh, hearing from our constituents, our priority is really going to be home ownership or it's really going to be rental or seniors or what have you. Um, but this just puts some guard, some sort of a, a starting place to frame the conversation. Let's go ahead. And then we listed out a whole bunch of potential actions. Um, those are in your handout and we can hone in on those in the discussion. And you can say, hey, this is off the table. It doesn't fit for Del Nord. Or gosh, let's really talk more about this and how do we get it going? Let's keep going. So then the same thing, here's the dashboard for South Park, uh, or South <laughs> Park, Fork. Yeah, sorry. That must happen all oh, so, uh, It's like, people always call me Willow. Um, so. Um, so that, uh, you know, um, again, I think this will be, we can round out the picture here a lot uh, more with that percentage of homes that are unoccupied, the second home dynamic. Um, but uh, um, a snapshot for you and, you know, um, an emphasis here that your inventory in South Fork is very much single family homes, um, which kind of gets to that affordability and choices issue. Um, that is when we poll people, everyone wants a single family home, but that may not be the most affordable and efficient solution in every case. Um, and so if we were able to um, create some more opportunities that were townhouses or duplexes that could really support the variety and choices in South Fork. Um, South Fork also represents a very small number of households compared to the county overall. Um, and that's really being driven by how many homes are vacant. Um, so, Let's keep going. Again, so it's the same kind of math problem um, that I shared with Del Norte um, based on Rio Grande incomes. Um, because so few homes are occupied, it results in a very small range of units needed, about 12, 15 to 20. Um, again, you could make a decision to shoot for higher, but I, I do caution you to test the market, start small and test the market. Um, and then the same thing with potential actions. This is a big old brainstorm list of potential actions. We can take things off the table. We can add things. Um, that's really the heart of this portion of like developing the draft. Um, so yeah, I think we are now to our discussion. Um, do, are we, so just given a very brief overview and that some of you may be seeing these documents for the first time, are we kind of on the right track? Um, is anything particularly jumping off the page at you or being like, God, that is, that is not actually um, resonating with what I experience as a local situation? I just have a question. I, um, did you stratify the needs of people in Del Norte, whether they wanted to own a home or rent or share homes? Did you? Did yeah, you we have it? not okay. done that, but that is something we certainly can. Okay. Um, well, I always want to like take notes in the moment, but um, mm -hmm. Andrew on the phone is taking notes. We'll have to that. <laughs> so, so we did start with employer surveys um, in the data collection and then do plan residential surveys during uh, action planning to kind of hear what the residents and the people who live and work here would like to see happen. Uh, we're just not at that phase yet. So it is 
something that the team that's working on this study definitely wants to hear. We started with the kids by offering a youth art project where they could tell us based on their age group what they loved most about their community. Um, and we've gotten some really cute uh, art pictures and things from their local school districts. And then we're moving on to the adults in June and we're gonna do both um, a video voice or a photo contest where they can tell us like what they really love and what they would like to see more of through a video of them going around their community and saying like, I like this house or we have too many of this style. Um, and then we'll do some surveys as well. And you know, another, yes. I don't know, just walking around Del Norte uh, on a consistent basis, I think we have a, a couple of major problems. One is that we have um, run down houses. Now, and I don't mean run down, they're, they're old, they have not been maintained or modernized, and they're probably some of them I think are maybe second, third, fourth generation. And I don't think we have any chance of those people moving out because that's that, that's their affordable housing. And then on the other hand, we have um, blight uh, uh, homes that are abandoned and have been abandoned, looks like for 30 years. I don't know, maybe not that long. We have a lot of infill that we could do in Del Norte. I don't know the answer to that other than maybe developing an urban rural authority. Um, but, and that's difficult because you need someone to manage it. And our um, municipality staff is, is small and limited. I, I think we um, kind of at a standstill there. We need to get rid of the blight in town. And um, it's gonna be uh, a long haul. Yeah, well said. I'm gonna add to that. You know, as if you look, most of the vacant lots have been built. And so that's what's leading us closer and closer to the blighted properties as being the area of infill that's not available. And that's why we're discussing whether there needs to be a URA at the town level, which puts pressure on the town board, it puts pressure on the administration to run that. I mean, towns do it all the time. It's not that it's unachievable, but it, it's a big step to turn around and say, we're going to have to condemn some of these in order to get them back into the market to, to do the work necessary, the brown fills them out, to, to, to tear down what's completely unusable and make that a lot that now could become a home for a family and, and bring them back. Uh, we rode with them for a long time because we didn't need that. We didn't need that real estate, but we're, we're growing to a point where we do and, and it's, it's starting to affect people moving here I spent yesterday with the whole state employees out of Penitente Canyon and talking with them. At one point, maybe a half dozen years ago, they would come to the valley, they'd want to move to Del Norte. They're priced out now. They're living in other towns and uh, making it clear that they're priced out. And mm -hmm. so it's like, okay, thanks. But yeah. that's that's real. And, yeah. and that's what's happening. Also, your your numbers, you know, when you're looking at that, you know, the building outside the, you know, in the, the, the unincorporated county. Those are people that probably didn't make a great business landfall in town and moved out there. They're coming from outside and coming from anywhere on the front range of town. What you get for your house there buys you 40 acres, a barn, a house, and the money to live on, on that property. And, and that kind of eschews your, your rainbow chart. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been thinking the rainbow chart might need to have like a um, stratosphere or like a purgatory or something on it because there's like a whole different thing going on with with that um, with the amount of wealth that people are experiencing from the boom front range and other places. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you. I think that you know, one of the things I'm really intrigued about with the homes that are either in great disrepair or abandoned is the opportunity, um, like sort of some interventions that happen before a condemnation. You know, is there an opportunity to go to the tax lien records or go to the existing buyer and approach them? Um, and if that was something that could be done in a prioritized, you know, way with a group like, I'm going to pick on Dawn and assign her more work because she's not busy enough. But like, with a, you know, because I, I also hear what you're saying around if you take on this initiative, you need the staff um, capacity to keep it going, and that's a pretty big commitment too. And it's, these are complex issues. So if there was a group that could kind of prioritize and say, you know, we're going to try to do one in Del Norte and one, one in Salach and just get started, um, you know, and then there's someone who has that expertise and there's enough, like across the region, there's a whole enough to keep them busy. Yeah, one, one person could handle more than one town. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have a, a, high, a higher, someone working with the urban rural authority. Yeah. Initiative. Um, awesome. What other things are uh, jumping off the page at you or that you'd like to talk about so far? Yeah. <laughs> uh, one is a, a question about the, kind of tying into what you were saying about the an, an entity taking over blighted houses, which I'm assuming means abandoned because there, so there's no people in it. And is that something? Do I remember that Lonnie was doing something like that? Yeah, they have a URA. Oh, okay, cool. And do they're just for out of curiosity, does I'm assuming Monty's picture looks similar to Del Norte? Yeah, actually, it'd be great to hear from Andrew because they've they gotten a program going there that we could build on. You want to share about that? Yeah, yeah. So we funded um, as their urban renewal authority, and um, they did a survey and had like 114 vacant and dilapidated homes. And, um, we awarded them, I think it was around like six hundred thousand dollars. And basically, the idea was, you know, they would purchase homes for, you know, uh, like back taxes or you know, back utilities or whatever it is. Most of the homes are, you know, whoever lived in them either like passed away or moved out, and uh, those passed on to like family members who lived in like Phoenix or wherever, and you know, just forgot about it. Um, so. The only issue that we had with that, um, we just we awarded them federal funds, which had so many you know strings attached that it was just a good fit. Um, because they found that once they went in to the homes, you know, the idea was they would like rehabilitate homes that could be rehabilitated and then scrape the ones that couldn't, um, and you know, put like a new you know modular structure or whatever. Um, then they would sell the homes to 80% AMI households. And I think it was like maybe like one out of five could be sold at market rate just to make the numbers work better. Um, what they found was they couldn't renovate any of the homes because they were all like, beyond repair. Um, and CDG funds, which is the uh, funding source that we use, you can't do it with, you can't do new construction. Um, so we're kind of in the process right now. We're going to like recapture those funds and then reissue state funds because state funds, you know, we can be a lot more creative. With. Um, but I think that that, pro that program has a huge potential um, in any small town in Colorado, you know, because there's not a small town in Colorado that doesn't have that problem with like vacant and dilapidated homes. Um, one of the things that, you know, like you said, you need somebody to do that, just that. And in my, it was Forrest, yep. and he's got a town to run, <laughs> you know, so you can't do both. Um, so I think that's something that we're building into that kind of like reissue of state funds is, you know, funding for at least like a part-time person to handle that, you know? So, um, yeah. But it, the great thing is too, is, you know, it, it took them a year after we awarded them to basically like write guidelines for this program. But now that they've done it, you know, you can take those guidelines in Del Norte and scratch out on a Vista or Del Norte and, you know, you're ready to go. So, um, I think a few other things you want to change. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think that, like, if there, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, Monty was kind of like our guinea pig. I think it's starting to take up a little bit more steam. So, I think that it would help me to be a lot more willing to have fun. 
Andrew, did they have to condemn some of the properties in order to? I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure, I, you know, I bet that they did. Um, I know that, like, I've kind of um, go around and forth, uh, told me, like, you know, check out this one and this one and this one. Um, some of them were like, you know, really they were dangerous. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, and Andrew, do you know how they prioritized? I out of 114, actually, that's a lot. I didn't say that, you from? Sure that there were that many in Montesquieu, but no, yeah. really, you know, um, I don't know how they prioritize, but you know, that, I think that that's something that, you know, each community kind of, um, yeah. do themselves like they got their own priorities. So if I remember right, they prioritized tearing down ones that couldn't be saved first so that yeah. the lot could be used and then looking at the ones that could be saved. And those are the ones they're kind of working on now. Um, I believe also a part of the holdup was as they were getting these homes, they had to do things like lead-based paint and asbestos testing before they could be taken down, yeah. which was a process because we don't have someone local. So you got to bring someone in from Springs or Denver. And so you're working on someone else's schedule. <laughs> oh, and that's got to be a mess. Trying to, I mean, the bureaucracy that, I would think the red tape involved in something like that on the front range or in the city in the urban area is just is utilizing it's like, yeah. you know, it's a whole different like process, you know. Um, I mean, just that, is there brownfields involved in that that's, too? That's exactly what it is. Yeah. I don't know if EPA would actually like designate uh, like a residential home as brownfield because of like asbestos or lead or lead um, But you do have to go through that whole you know remediation process and make like these very expensive. You know? But we have I mean, um, we have a nice example from a home um, that Dawson Street did in Antonita, like where they did do asbestos remediation and it salvage the home, you know, mm -hmm. and so I think it's a matter of having someone who has, because once you, once you navigate the red tape, then you're an expert in that kind of, you know, and it's like, so let's just have, let, if we can have someone who's consistently able to do that instead of having sort of read your, you know, reinvent the wheel. Very intrigued. <laughs> um, so um, let's see, is there anyone on the phone who wanted to comment at this juncture? The Zoom is quiet. <laughs> I'm the only one talking in the chat, so I think we're probably good to move on. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let's. So this. So we have about half an hour left, and we wanted. We had sort of three different things we wanted to get your feedback on. Um, so goals and priorities is one. Um, land and partnerships is number two, and number three is existing programs and getting better utilization of them. So that is like when Dawn introduced herself, the things she talked about with um, down payment assistance and re rehab, and there's you know weatherization through Energy Resource um, uh, Center, and um, you know there's financial counseling classes, and there's all these different things that are available already that we don't have to create a new program, but we'd love for more people um, from this area to be using them. So of those three things, what? Sounds most interesting to talk about in three law. What were the three? I should have got this one. Um, so, um, goals and priorities, land and partnerships, or existing programs, and how to better get people to use them. Okay. Um, and people on the phone, you're welcome to chime in with these too. If something sounds particularly the, uh, that you'd like to talk about. <laughs> and please help yourself with drinks and snacks. And um, I just want to mark there we go. Maybe I have a question. Maybe it's directed more to you, Adam. But um, like, if we're gonna go back to the rainbow, that you you can work in this section of it. But the money that is available to be used, how can it best be used? Because I feel like to talk about any of these is all gonna take money. Yeah. And so. If there's available funding, what can that be for? And then that helps my brain think about what could be accomplished. Totally. Um, so, yeah, division of housing, there's a couple of bills that passed a couple of years ago, um, like 2019, that um, were supposed to increase 
start funding for a specific line item or housing development grant funds, um, which we normally get like $9 million a year. Um, we were supposed to get an extra $8 million this year for this coming fiscal year, $9 million uh, next fiscal year, and then like $33 million, uh, like on top of our, you know. So the pandemic kind of like, you know, shifted a couple things. I think one of the bills pushed, got pushed back uh, or one of the like um, the contributions got pushed back two years. Anyway, we're starting to see some of that money like trickle in now. Uh, that can be used for, would you say like the, you think the peak of this will be like 2024 ish? Probably, yeah. Which is great for us because it takes a long time to get projects like yeah. into the pipeline. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, that money can be used for, I don't want to say anything, but like new construction, you know, rental projects, uh, acquisition rehab of existing projects, home ownership projects. So we can like, you know, uh, subsidize new construction for home ownership. That's actually, I think, one of the biggest uh, potentials uh, for the Valley because uh, the legislature also passed that if you're doing Home ownership uh, construction project that money can be used for 120 percent AMI households in rural areas, um, which just opens that possibility up to like so many more people. Um, our our funds, you know, if we're funding uh, a rental project, technically our funds can only be used for 60 percent AMI units and below. It doesn't mean that we can't include higher income units, so you can do like a mixed income project and do, you know, have a 30% unit, a couple 60% units and some market rate units, which just kind of um, means we would just do our math differently on how we subsidize per unit. Um, typically we, you know, I always kind of like bring up the example of like a big front range project that's like $10 million in 15 units. Um, we have a limit of $15,000 a unit. Um, or thirty thousand dollars if it's supportive housing, um, but that's a whole other of words. Um, so supportive so housing you know, is a term of art for um, housing that serves people who experience homelessness. Right. Um, so if you're you've got a fifty unit project and you're getting fifteen thousand dollars a unit, and it's ten million dollars a unit, you're getting what is that? Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I think. That's a huge chunk of change for you know, like. Big development project, but if you're doing 10 units, 150 grand, and you know your total development costs are 1.4 million, like that's not going to go as far. So in rural areas, I think we're like a little bit more willing to be a larger part of that funding stack um, and kind of exceed our ranges. Um, and I am arguing that you know we like because these projects don't happen like little 10 unit rental projects. They almost never happen because it's so hard to get that funding. The rents are so low down here that you know you can't take on as much debt, so you need that sort of like free money, you know. Um, in the front range, they have the tax credit program, which provides like eighty to eighty-five percent of uh, the equity needed to like build a big project, but that only works for like thirty units and above, which you know, Alabama can handle thirty, fifty units. But, but like Del Norte, if you try to build like 50 units in Del Norte, like, like you have a hard time losing up in a time manner, I think, you know? So, you know, there, I think there's a lot of willingness and um, people are starting to realize more that if we want to do these small projects in small communities, like we must be willing to like to be a larger part of the project. So. And I'd love to, oh, okay, it sounds like there's a couple of questions and things, but I also want to give Jeff a chance to talk about Chapa because Chapa oh, yeah. is also focused on small rural projects and how to support them. Um, so let's take the questions and then we'll come to Jeff. Like small means. I don't, I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's <laughs> below 30. So, so in, what is your below 30, 30 is the below 30 units. Below 30 is, yeah. is so kind of what the what, state funders consider small because what's your break even? What is, what is too small? No, what's your so price? break even depends on the, the property itself. So it's really, until you have a project going, it's really hard to figure some of these terms out. But you can't do a can unit. Oh, you no, no, you can. You can. can. Yeah. So here's <laughs> um, the prop, like part of why we've gotten into this, into the whole puzzle piece of this whole affordability is that 
the market isn't responding and providing like five and 10 unit rental projects. Right. So what that, that's a gap we're actually honing in on that we really need. And so Andrew's kind of describing some of the reasons it's been so hard to fund it. And I think the funders are becoming a lot more aware that they need to use different tools when they're talking to a developer than a developer. Yeah. Um, so if that if that's fair, um, what other questions were several of you were kind of like I need to talk. <laughs> I think his re your response perfectly um, sh it shows one of the goals that we have to have. I mean, it's a very simple question, and the answer is so complex. <laughs> right? The complexity of this universe is such a we we need a a way to show towns this is a government problem yeah. when we're at 80 percent in the last day of mind yeah. it's not a market problem mm -hmm. right and so we have you know every small town i'm not criticizing any of the towns we have but we're lay people running towns yeah we're not housing it what happened we have no idea what success are like we yeah. need somebody to give us a map mm -hmm. so i would love to one of the goals to be to Bonnie's point, a shared resource somewhere that is tasked with assuring that each town has a plan. Yeah. And I think the, the, this has been a building problem for a while, but now every town is aware, <laughs> keenly aware. And I'm, I think the moment is right for every town to say, just show us the way, we'll sign up. Yeah. Well, so, no, yes. yeah go ahead, Jeff. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's the perfect segue, Michael. Softball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll catch that ball. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Chapa and the Division of Housing and other partners, including Willa and other consultants, we've been working on this idea of the situation, the gulf, the gap that exists with. Um, the rural parts of Colorado in particular uh, and housing um, and just exactly what you described, Mike, is that uh, there's just, you know, when you have the, these large tax credit projects on the front range and in the urban areas, uh, you've got developers that they know what to do and they're going to take command and they can get these projects done. Uh, in rural areas, uh, not so much. You know, you have very, very few and far between people who know how to deal with a housing development project. And so what we're, <clears throat> about a year and a half ago, we started something called the Small Scale Innovation or Housing Innovation Project, SHIP, S-H-I-P. And it is designed for these smaller projects and um, uh, to the discussion earlier, it's anywhere from 30 on down to two, so a duplex. And um, so we're looking at it in two different ways. One is, uh, and the most important uh, to your point, Mike, is that uh, we're providing a continuum of technical assistance. So right now there is a guide that gives details on how to do a housing project that will be published and it'll be available electronically and in paper um, for uh, anybody to be able to have access to and get kind of that step-by-step -step approach. Um, we're providing, uh, Andrew and I have been busy working on a toolkit uh, training that will be a two-day toolkit training uh, for that we're calling Rural Development Toolkit um, that will be, you know, people in a classroom and it could be uh, Harry and Joe from, uh, from South Fork uh, with, you know, a group of people that have an idea for housing in a community and they just want to learn how to go through this process. They may have land and you might have uh, you know, a particular project in mind. Um, it could be an infill situation like what Marty was mentioning earlier, um, where some people, or it might be a mom and pop, you know, it might be somebody that just owns a piece of land or has a building that they want to remodel into housing and having them a chance to be able to get together over a two day period and kind of work through what a project is. 
But the premier part of all of this continuum is being able to provide teams of consultants that can help with these specific projects. So Willa actually is part of a team of consultants um, and there's another team that we've been working with and we've got an initial pilot group of projects uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, there's gonna be six or seven of them that will go through this process with these consultants to say, okay, what do you, where are you at? And where do we need to get you to be able to get you uh, to the point that you can get this housing project taken care of? And so not doing the work, the consultants are not doing it, but they're guiding the, the, the people along the process. So we have one up in Moffat the, uh, uh, who lives in actually Sarah White, who lives in Del Norte. Uh, she's the superintendent up there and she wants to do uh, workforce housing for her teachers. And so uh, uh, we've got a team that's gonna help uh, kind of help with that, that vision. Another one is in San Luis. Um, a family that owns the building that housed the first bank in Colorado, two doors down from r, &R Market, the first uh, or the oldest uh, small business in Colorado. And they want to do some commercial on the bottom floor of this building and some housing on top and possible infill in a lot that's behind their, their building. Um, uh, we may do one in Alamosa as well, but those are the kind of projects that we're going to say, okay, let's provide this technical assistance. It's all provided for free um, and just really give some direction to these projects. Uh, we're also doing some financial helps as well. Um, and so Mike will be talking with you. It's, it's really being able to partner with local banks on how uh, we can help uh, provide some more funding. Um, and then we're partnering, partnering with uh, Andrew as well and others to see what we can do. So anyway, uh, there's quite a movement going towards trying to help with the small scale housing around the state. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, sure. about that. Okay. Jeff, um, this party, um, these, these projects that you're mentioning, St. Louis, they're privately owned, correct? I mean, there's not government in it. This, this is all being transacted between your organization or, uh, I mean, the money's coming from somewhere outside of here to help those folks. That's, that's all been approved. That's all, I mean, you can actually do that. You can help private people develop what the town needs if they're willing to take it on and, and uh, take on the responsibility, take on all the debt, whatever that's involved. Yeah, actually, Marty, it's a variety. Um, and so uh, it's it's kind of evenly split between like we're doing one in Hinsdale County with Lake City and it's the county that's doing it. Um, all the county commissioners are involved with it. And so that's going to be county owned. Um, it's going to be on a really interesting uh, one that might be able to be applied uh, and duplicated in your area, certainly in Creed. Um, but where there's, and in and, and Del Norte too, it would work because there's lots of federally owned land. So, you know, you've got BLM uh, surrounding and uh, some forest service. But what this is in Lake City is the forest service has a piece of ground that's right adjacent to the town. 96% of Hensdale County is, is federally land, owned land. And so they've only got 4% land to work with for housing, but uh, the 2018 Farm Bill provided uh, an opportunity for federal land to be used for housing, um, housing projects, uh, as long as one of the units can be used for, for that federal agency for workforce housing. So that's, that's one. So there is government owned land uh, the one in Alamosa that we're looking at would be uh, owned by La Puente. So that's another possibility as nonprofits to be able to do it. Um, and then this one in Moffat would be school owned, uh, but then it could be privately as well, like the one in San Luis. So I appreciated this with, you know, with Chaffa's approach with this project is that they're trying to cast a really broad net because we know like pretty much none of these things happen without public sector and private sector participation. Um, so I'd love to share a story if you all are willing about how we use some of Andrew's money in Gunnison. 
Um, so it is a project I've been the consultant to the city of Ghanasan on, and they had bought 14 acres um, to develop a park and preserve wetlands that have um, access to the Gunnison River and West Gunnison. And as they were starting to plan the park, the city council is like, our highest priority is housing. We have this land. It actually happens to have some dilapidated and abandoned camp cabins and a restaurant building that is, in my opinion, beautifully built and never got CO. So it's, <laughs> um, so it's this big old shell of a building. And they're like, wait, you know, suddenly they just like connected the dots. Like, okay, we own this. We have a housing goal. Let's do something with it. So they selected a private sector developer who's a local guy who's really passionate about housing for people in the community. And he is renovating the cabins, building some new little townhouses. We're going to use Andrew's money to deed restrict a portion of the property. And we're building some market rate. Some of the house, um, townhouses and duplexes will be market rate too. And we think that those will be very attainable and attractive to people in the community um, they're just at a little higher price point. So um, that is going to, we've been working on it for two years and it's going to break ground next week. Whew. Thank you for pushing those contracts through. <laughs> if we get them signed today. Yeah, if we get them signed today. I think we will. Um, so that, you know, just kind of like a little bit of a success story, but it was like, you know, it was the, it was the city's commitment. It was this private sector guy who had the motivations and it was getting some help. So Andrew's money is about, it's 1.3 million and it's gonna help us. There's, we need like, I mean, we need a street that's from here to the back of the room, but it costs so much. Um, so it's gonna help us build that street and extend those utilities we need. And then there's like a loop drive too, but yeah. Anyway, it gets us the site ready. Okay, that's owned by the city of, of, city of yeah. Gunnison. Yeah. They can sell townhomes off of their property. Do they, they still own the underlying property? Are they still the housing authority for that property? Yeah, great technical questions. Yeah. So they actually, um, in this case, um, they will convey the, the, the townhomes will be, the land will be conveyed underneath them. They're not gonna retain ownership, okay. but they're gonna keep, and they do have a housing authority. Actually, yeah, so I, I didn't mention the housing authority is also a partner in this because Gunnison has a multi-jurisdictional housing authority and they will monitor the deed restriction. So when a person goes to sell their home, the housing authority will help them make sure the next person's qualified. So nobody, can, so the qualifications are 80% of your income is earned in the Gunnison Valley. So you can't come from the outside and get your vacation rental, um, but you can if you have if you just got a job as a hospital as a nurse or whatever, if you show the housing authority you're going to be an employee, you can come, you can move in. Okay. You addressed a little of that in, in, I don't remember which one of your documents. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the fact that there has to be a protection that people don't come in, take advantage of this, this readily available money to do this without their money and then flip the house. Mm -hmm. to, totally. For, start jacking the prices up and, and it just exacerbate the problem we already have yeah, right yeah i mean that's you know it's it's two years of everyone's time and commitment and a ton of public resources that got this to happen and so to have it flip to have speculation occur out of it would be what's the point yeah, yeah. correct okay thank you yeah yeah um yes real quick so i'm real curious about jeff's as the oh the district ranger here for the forest service i'm real curious about the Tinsdale county example yeah i would love some like asterisks or i would love for that fed land option <laughs> to get some caveats to it before that gets latched onto as a great idea yeah <laughs> you know because i think that there, i mean to the point that fed stuff comes with strings i think that there's probably some strings that yeah. need to get understood before that's really we'll say important. don't over promise yeah exactly. <laughs> um so i am excited about the Tinsdale. i'm actually going to stop by the site on my way home tomorrow tonight um, because I'm a technical assistance consultant on that small world, right? We get to win a lot of hats. Um, so that is, it's administrative land of the Forest Service. And so, and there's already a couple modular structures on it and they can make it use it better. It's annexed into the city, um, into Lake City. Um, and so it's clearly defined within those rules. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I do think that having federal agency here at the table is really awesome because obviously you have employee, employee 
housing mismatch problems mm -hmm. and that you can be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'd love to maybe while we're talking about land, just a little bit on the constraint that we started talking about. And then, yeah. Oh, maybe Mike, we should refer to what you're talking about the water constraint. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, we only have, we, we, we have 20 more minutes. So. <laughs> So, of course, uh, maybe everybody's aware that we have a subdistrict system, the managed aquifer, and subdistrict one is continually losing ground on its levels of its aquifer. And there's a variable fee system that is designed to make it more expensive to pump water if you don't have surface water. Okay. That variable fee has never been enough to change behavior. They are now on Tuesday announcing a $500 an acre foot fee, which is going from not enough to change behavior to if you don't own the surface water, you probably can't farm. It's a water in, water out type of thing. Now, I don't know if that's a done deal or not. It does mean that if somebody has to pump water to produce a crop at that kind of rate, they ain't going to do it. And that means there's going to be a lot of ground that is not farmed, and farmers are going to leave, and houses are going to be empty, and towns are, and Alamosa is going to have some really big impacts. A lot of this is going to have big impacts. Del Norte's going to have some impacts, and Southport probably is okay. Um, but and what's okay. That probably still means some impacts. You know, nobody escapes. Is that a good summary? Yeah, and I think the, I guess the two, the two components that I'm curious about is one, when we're looking at what is the sort of catch up housing, but I mean, that we absolutely do. And we're looking at like wanting the economic development and we want to have, you know, the people who are here have houses and to have thriving, successful communities. And also, like, there's a hard stop at how much the basic like water there is. I mean, we're land rich and water extremely poor. Yeah. And what's the what is the ceiling of development and number of people that we can support in this valley with the water situation? Mm -hmm. So we don't end up. I mean, we're a far cry from Phoenix, but we we have yes. the acreage uh, and with the connection into the groundwater pool and where the ag community starts to have the major financial disincentive from continuing in, into ag is that now there's all of this land. And what, what feels a little tenuous to me is the current restriction on uh, one one domestic well per 36 acres, I think yeah. it is. And at what point is the pressure to re re relieve that requirement going to happen because there's the clamor for one, from one side on needing to create housing here is all of a sudden this vacant ag land. The only limitation is a uh, 36 acre per well requirement. And that seems, I, I don't know how secure that is. And to me, that's a, that puts us in, a, on, on one hand, that puts us down a path towards the option for a lot of increase in development. And at the same time, it is uh, quite at odds with the hard stop on the amount of water we actually have here. And the general infrastructure that we just don't have capacity in the as as is and or the economy to support. I, mean, I think that there's a little bit of a ball of wax. Big time. And I think I mean, we see this, it's not as I'm curious actually to hear from you all about the dynamics in Rio Grande County, but in some of the other counties in the valley, there's a very much like giant 35 giant subdivisions of 35 acre plots that people have this dream of this cheap land and then they get there and there's really a lot of cost and challenge to actually build a home on it. Mm -hmm. um, plus, you know, plus just how remote you are. Um, so I think, thank you for highlighting that. I think it's something that we should put into the report as a consideration and constraint and like, you know, I don't have the answers, um, but it's very much, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, your question about sort of at the state level, does this get changed? I don't know. Um, and I, and I don't know what the right answer is either, um, but I do think that that does put more emphasis on the how do you do housing proximate to places that have 
water, you know, wastewater treatment and um, access to municipal kinds of water. Um, yes, there's upstream considerations of where does that water actually come from, who has those rights, but um, it is, you know, another case for sort of like the services are here in your towns. Um, can we do more close to town? We do have an online question as well. Um, Melinda would like to know if anybody knows if these new rules are going to affect like municipal wells like in the town of Moffitt or other areas. I think those rules are already promulgated. Yeah, the rules, yeah they are. And they apply to every single well there is. Right. You have to augment your water as a municipality as well. Okay. Yeah. You either augment it or you can join a sub district. Yeah. And some way you have to pay for that. Use. That's a really poor choice. You're better off if you figure out a way to augment it. Right. And then this stuff is also going to impact Southport huge. Southport's been just outside of that. But uh, the, they're, they're, Current their first water system, town owned online, and it's going to be a, a big entry into the 21st century for them. But they're still, their town is reliant on over 60 water systems, none of which are acknowledged by the Department of uh, Natural Resources. And so it, it's going to become an issue at some point as the, this, the water rules and regs kick in. And they start talking about shutting down farms that produce jobs, revenue, because they don't have senior water. And you got people up here drawing this off for multiple lots, and it's they don't have any water rights. And, and so it, it's going to it's going to be for South Fork an, an impact that goes to all of this. Uh, and you know, most of South Fork is undeveloped property because they're sold to single family dwelling. It's mm -hmm. empty. And only recently have their planning and zoning started addressing that we're just going to have to bite the bullet and put some multifamily in these neighborhoods and allow it to happen. And, and I don't know what the pushback is going to be against their town board, but uh, they're realizing that it's not going to get better until they start adjusting some things to it. But, but water is going to be the biggest issue as they start to develop. There's going to be more and more state people looking at Southport saying, well, where are you getting that water? Do you know what that means? Is that even yours or are you stealing it from somebody else? But, but those rules are not new. That's not, if there's no connection with what's happening uh, with this change in the fee, those are rules that have yeah. been in place for a while yeah. and they're, you know, they've just got grappled. Yeah, the, the rules have been promulgated for, for a while. Yeah, the sub-district, I mean, they started off with their, you know, what, three years ago, four years ago, maybe five or six, at $50, $45 to yeah. your foot, which is a joke price. Right. So that everybody could do whatever they wanted and they weren't changing anything. And now in that short amount of time, they're looking at a tenfold increase, which is virtually punitive. It's punitive. Right. And, uh, it, uh, exactly. How hard is to see when I push them? Because yeah. they, right. they, they want sub district five, which is so much. And you know, there's there's a lot of ag up there that, that we're going to have a long dead summer. Uh, if, if they do that to the center, they do that to sub district one. Which maybe, maybe the the bigger message here is all those rules mm -hmm. are going to be enforced. Yeah, and they're signaling in a in a slow way over the last two years. Get ready, get ready, yeah. get ready. And now they're starting to put the hammer down and there is no escape. Yeah, and, and it's there, they they can't pick winners and losers. They're gonna to have to take the entire sub district and crack the whole thing. Right. It's not like okay, well, you've been a good person and you had some direct and towns sure. are gonna learn that they are not gonna get uh grace anymore. Yeah. Um that the ownership of that or the augmentation of that water is just simply going to be required or it isn't going to happen. Yeah, or they're going to want even a small well, single well on, on Cambridge, the, the, you know, the 35 acre single well piece makes it uh, a exempt well because it's using very small, it's, it's enough water to run one house. But as that density increases, all of a sudden it's a water system. Mm -hmm. And that means rules and regs are not going to be played. Right? And, and they're not going to cut anybody in slack. But 
but the tools are there. I mean, the, you yeah. can get augmented water and yeah. I mean, all there's of that a, exists. It's just cost money. Deal with it, but you have to deal with it. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not getting any cheaper. <laughs> so I'm going to bring this back because we just have about yes, five minutes. <laughs> this is a very important constraint. Um, and, I and I think something we can dig into more. So um, does anyone else have comments or uh, anything you want to make sure is highlighted? I really appreciated this um, idea about one of the goals kind of being around reducing the complexity or like having a knowledge bank or resource for um, to navigate this very jargony world we live in. Um, what else, you know, would you want to make sure I hear before you leave? <laughs> Yes, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, I, I am curious. I think you're probably, this is part of your plan, but when you, the report is finished, are you going to go to each town, municipality to present? Because I, I'm kind of disappointed we don't have the county here. I'm happy the Hort's here. I'm happy South Fork is here, but disappointed not more are here on such an important issue. And so I think you got to go to them. Yeah, so we can, I'll, I'll work with Don on what we do, um, because we were, so we did, we just finished, Alamosa kind of went ahead of the other communities, and we just finished their action plan, um, and we actually took it on, we took our show on the road and did eight or so presentations, including a bunch of the nonprofit boards, housing authority, economic development, um, and several times, this, or several check-ins with city council and planning commission. Obviously, that deep a dive for a community the size of Del Norte, like we probably can't do, but we could certainly like ask to come to a public meeting notice meeting, for example, come to you know, come to town council if that's attractive. So, um, you know, I think long story long, like yes, we want to get the word out more, um, more, and we need to kind of target that to what the needs want. Yeah. I would say it's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> so, but additionally to the county commissioner meeting as well. Okay. We have reached out to the Valley Wide County Commissioner meeting. Sure. Um, they can't get us on the agenda till like August, which is just about perfect because that's right about the time it's all finished. Um, we have sent several emails to municipalities around the valley, and unfortunately, Del Norte and South Fork were two that we never heard back from. Um, but we continued on because we did hear from your residents and we did hear from your business owners that we definitely needed to be in these communities. And so that's why we're still here. Um, but we'll continue to reach out. We've sent copies to the, I mean, I think I have like one address for each municipality that we could find online and we've sent invitations. We've sent, um, the documents to them, um, you know, Alamosa County is another one because the city of Alamosa was doing their own. So Alamosa County did not get involved, but we're still doing communities in their county as well. Um, so we haven't let that deter us and we will continue to get the word out and spread the word. Um, the biggest thing I can say is if you know personally somebody, um, encourage them to reach out to me, encourage them to join the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition Facebook page. We're sharing it on tons of social media pages and outlets, as well as websites and emails and phone calls. I mean, we've sat down and called people. So encourage them that they need to pay attention to our emails and that they need to be part of these meetings because um, we're we, happy to we, have them. We've sent it out to all of our membership, mm -hmm. 230 people, and I individually sent it out to our county commissioners and our city right. managers, city Many chambers are sending the information yeah, out for sure, us sure. to businesses and stuff and as well. So we have a we've reached out and we sent it to a lot of people. We're just not getting the same reach back. Oh, <laughs> so we will yeah. keep working at it and we will start showing up at meetings if we have to. But during this process, it was such a big step already that we didn't hit every meeting that we would have liked to. Your persistence is John <laughs> is fabulous uh, in terms of outreach and I think getting the word out. And I think these pieces that are less like meeting-y, the, like the art 
stuff and the, that's going to be super cool. Um, so I want to say if you have comments on the actual documents or questions, um, Don and I are gathering those um, hopefully by about June 18th so that we can um, update and issue drafts and incorporate all this good conversation. Um, and then we're going to be on our next listening tour. Um, so these are all the communities we're coming to, to yesterday and today are at the top. And then the next batch is um, hopefully June 24th and 25th. Um, and then I do like the idea that we kind of have through and what's the, how do we get the, how do we connect with people around the final versions and also the next, um, the next steps of actions in specific towns and regional coordination. So, um, with that, I think we are, we're right at, I think at time and um, just so appreciate your time and thoughtfulness on this topic um, here today with us. Please do continue to send thoughts and um, ideas as they come up. If there's like uh, that aha about um, a, a piece of land or an initiative we could take, um, we'd really love to hear from you guys. Um, anything else on the phone? No, just thank you so much. I'm so thrilled uh, with who showed up. Um, because you got some good feedback um, at this stage. So thank you everybody for coming. And uh, we'll, I, you know, as we start doing these other meetings, it'll be important to have this network to continue to encourage certain people that you want to be there to come. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys. That's a great one. That's we set up the my housing story at gmail.com specifically for the housing study. Um, we've posted on Facebook and people have sent us their stories like in writing. They're sending the art projects and the different things there. So that's a great one. Um, but you can also reach me directly after the study at the dot slvhc.com. That's my minute not going anywhere. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I love it. If you want to take a picture, like send a picture or whatever. That's great. Yeah. Nice. I didn't have like much of a problem.